On the 12th of February 2009, the eldest of four sisters, Qin Qiaomei, received a concerned call from her father. He told his daughter he'd been unable to contact her three younger sisters and was worried something happened to them. The three girls, aged between the ages of 24 and 21, were supposed to have visited him the previous day to have dinner together, but never turned up. He tried phoning them a number of times, but none of them answered, and now their phones were turned off. Qin Qiaomei, thinking her sisters who had recently moved to Nanning City from their hometown in Xiangzhou, a county in the city of Aibin, perhaps had just done what young people do, and gone out to enjoy the city's nightlife a little too much. She reassured her father that everything was probably fine, and she'd try contacting them herself. When she found that the phones were still turned off, she began to feel some concern herself. Her father asked her to accompany him to the apartments the sisters were renting to check on them. Qin Qiaomei was working in Guangzhou 500 kilometers away at the time, and had spare keys to her sister's apartments, so she got a train and headed to Nanning as fast as she could. The three young women, natives of the southern province Guangxi, had just moved to a residential community in the provincial capital Nanning. They decided to start their own family business together in the city, opening a clothes store. The two younger women, 21-year-old Qin Shan and 22-year-old Qin Qiaoping were sharing a seventh-floor apartment, while 24-year-old Qin Jie may rented her own room. Arriving at the community, their sister and father first checked an area where residents parked their electric bikes, and saw that those belonging to the sisters were still there. They then went to check the women's apartments. First they went to the room Qin Jie may rented. Finding no sign of her there, they next went to the seventh floor. Seeing how increasingly nervous her father was getting at the thought of what they would find inside, Qin Qiaomei went in first. Taking a quick look, as in the other apartment, everything seemed normal, the room was a little messy, but nothing you wouldn't expect from two twenty-somethings sharing an apartment together. However, there was no sign of her three younger sisters. On closer inspection, Qin Qiaomei began getting as concerned as her father. Clothes had been left soaking in the washing machine as if it had been turned off and not turned on again. She found her sister's phones, each of them shut down. More worryingly she found their handbags containing their ID and bank cards. Qin Qiaomei knew her sisters wouldn't have gone out and left those items behind. She began contacting friends of her sisters, asking if anyone had seen or heard from them in the last few days. When the replies all came back negative, Qin Qiaomei and her father contacted the police to report the three sisters as missing. When police arrived and gave the room a preliminary examination, they agreed that nothing seemed especially suspicious. They began interviewing residents of the building and the community. While it wasn't one of the older residential communities, there still weren't many security cameras in the area, so they had to rely on neighbors to try and get more information about the sisters' movements. They began by asking residents of the seventh floor if they had seen or heard anything on the day the women were believed to have gone missing. The neighbors all had the same story to tell, they hadn't heard anything unusual, no one had seen anything out of the ordinary. They didn't know of any conflicts the women were having with anyone else in the building or community, and no one had noticed any strangers hanging around. The shop the three sisters were running was doing solid business. Neighbors didn't see much of them during the week as they'd head to the store early and come home quite late. They didn't seem to have any boyfriends for police to question. Investigators checked the women's social media to see if it could give them at least a direction to look. But all they found were the typical sorts of things 20-somethings like to post online. The three women had vanished, seemingly without a trace. Days later, as police were searching the city for signs of the three sisters, two construction workers walking off their lunch had their attention grabbed by a pungent odor filling the air. The men were walking along a road at the rear of one of the city's residential communities which backed onto a quiet, wooded area. The smell was rancid enough to stir their interest in what could possibly be producing it. As they followed their noses, it only became more difficult to hold back the urge to vomit. The smell seemed to be coming from a green woven bag dumped a little back from the road, camouflaged by the foliage. Unable to stave off their curiosity of what was producing the stench, one of the men decided to take a look. He was greeted with the gruesome sight of obvious decomposing human remains. 
The men called the police, who soon arrived at the scene already assuming they knew who the bag of body parts belonged to. Confirming the discovery of human remains, they began searching the area quickly finding seven more bags containing more of the same. The dismembered bodies were sent for forensic examination, and police were told what they already knew. The bodies in the bags belonged to the three sisters, Qin Shan, Qin Jiemei, and Qin Qiaoping. The site their remains were left to rot was only 11 kilometers from their apartments. The police broke the news to a distraught father and older sister, and headed back to the sisters' community to give their apartments a full forensic examination, but found little to give them any clues as to what happened to the three women. They found small trace amounts of blood which someone had tried to clean up, but nothing to suggest this was where the women's bodies were dismembered. Investigators began considering the motives for the crime. Robbery had long been dismissed when this was just a missing person's case. There was no sign of forced entry, money was found lying around the apartment, their bags and bank cards hadn't been taken, neither had their phones or computers. With the three of them going missing, police did consider that the sisters had been kidnapped, thinking people knew they ran their own business and thought they were earning good money. But none of the neighbors had heard any kind of struggle. It was very unlikely that a group of people would have been able to take the three women without some noise coming from the room. While police waited for more information from medical examiners, they went back and interviewed community staff, residents, and the women's neighbors, but it continued to be little use. Shocked to hear the women were dead, the testimony from people interviewed remained the same, no one had seen or heard anything. Police had little to go on in finding and investigating a suspect. They had no witnesses, no weapon, no obvious motive, and didn't know where the crime took place. A reward of 100,000 RMB for any information leading to an arrest was offered, but it didn't bring them any leads. A couple of months into the investigation, the forensic team finally found something helpful. The only physical evidence of the crime were the bags used to dispose of the body parts. Seven out of the eight bags were just regular woven bags that had no unique features. One bag, with extensive examination, was found to have initials printed on it at one point, but had largely faded away. The forensic team managed to work out that the letters on the bag were for the Nanying Vocational Technical College. Police headed to the school to investigate, and were told that the bags are given to all students who enroll at the institution. It was a large list of potential suspects. Police began going through the list of current students and graduates and checking off their registered addresses, focusing on people who lived close to the residential community. They soon discovered the name Lai Xincheng, who'd graduated in 2007. He wasn't just a resident of the same community, he was a seventh-floor neighbor of the sisters. His room being diagonally opposite the room of the victims. As he'd lived so close to the women, police had already spoken to him seven times at his apartment, and each time he'd come across as calm and helpful, not giving any indication he was involved in the sisters' disappearance in any way. He lived alone and was working for a furniture company at the time. His story had remained consistent each time he spoke with police. He didn't know the girls, they didn't see each other often, and around the time of their disappearance, he'd taken sick leave from work for a few days, only leaving his apartment to get some medicine from a pharmacy nearby. His story was supported by his employer and pharmacy staff. With the new evidence police wanted to put a little pressure on the young man they considered their number one suspect and asked him to come chat with them at the police station. The change of environment saw a change in the demeanor of Lai Xincheng, he seemed a lot more nervous, and wasn't as talkative as he'd been in previous interviews. That however, could simply have been down to it being the young man's first ever visit to a police station. While investigators spoke with him, going over points they'd been over many times before, his apartment was being forensically examined. His apartment, much like that of the sisters, was what one would expect from a single man in his twenties living alone. It wasn't exactly clean, but it wasn't overly messy either. At first glance, nothing was especially notable to investigators, but slightly more than a month had passed since the death of the sisters. When the forensic examination team began looking a little more thoroughly, evidence quickly came to light. There'd been an obvious attempt to give the bathroom a good clean sometime recently, but it wasn't thorough enough. Police found evidence of blood and human tissue in the grouting around the bathroom tiles. There was evidence of blood splatter on hard-to-reach areas of the toilet and wash basin, and remnants of human tissue in the drains. 
Further traces of blood were found all over the walls of the main living space, showing up with the use of luminol, and more spots of blood were found on a pair of sneakers belonging to Lai Xincheng. While those samples were being tested for identification, interrogators were asking Lai Xincheng about the bag which once bore the initials of his college. He at first pleaded ignorance, but quickly changed his mind. He would tell officers correctly that they were given to everyone who attended the college, trying to play down the significance. He added that he'd thrown his away long ago and had no idea what happened to it after that. Interrogators then told him about the blood and human tissue found in his apartment, and it was being tested to identify who it belonged to. Lai Xincheng maintained ignorance, saying he knew nothing about the death of the sisters. Despite his denials, police held Lai Xincheng in detention until the results of the forensic tests came back. The blood and tissue in his apartment was a match to the three sisters. Once confronted with that evidence, the 25-year-old had little choice but to confess his guilt. He ended the lives of the three women, dismembered their corpses and dumped them behind the new city Sunshine residential community. On the 10th of February 2009, Qin Shan and Qin Xiaoping had returned to their seventh-floor apartment at around 8 o'clock in the evening. Unbeknownst to them, they were being watched by Lai Xincheng through the peephole in his door. Once the two women were in the room, he picked up a bag containing tape, rope, a hammer, pepper spray, and a folding knife. He went down to the fuse box for the apartment building and shut down the power to the sister's room. When the electricity went off, Qin Xiaoping told her sister she'd go and see what had happened, thinking she would only be a few minutes she left the door to the apartment open. As she made her way downstairs, Lai Xincheng was already back up on the seventh floor and walked towards the open door of apartment 703. He entered, shutting the door behind him, and was confronted by a shocked Qin Shan. Before she could shout, he temporarily blinded her with the pepper spray, following that up by plunging his knife into her thigh. He pushed her into the apartment's bathroom, gagged her with the tape and quickly bound her with rope. By the time he'd done, Qin Xiaoping was back knocking at the now closed door. She was greeted by Lai Xincheng, after a moment of shock she tried to back away but was grabbed by the intruder. He put his hand over her mouth and plunged the knife into her chest before dragging her inside. She too was pepper sprayed, gagged and bound, left terrified on the kitchen floor. His hostages under control, he waited. He'd been watching the women daily through the peephole in his door, and had grown to know their routines. He expected the third sister, Qin Jiemei, to be arriving soon. She appeared at around 9 in the evening, and was greeted by Lai Xincheng. She froze up, too terrified to try run away. Lai Xincheng pulled her inside. Like her sisters, she was gagged and bound, and all three were placed in the kitchen at the mercy, or lack of it, of their neighbor. When police began their investigation, and it was still being treated as a missing person case, they held the belief that they were searching for more than one suspect. Finding the remains as they did, only seemed to confirm they were looking for multiple people. It didn't seem likely that one person could enter a home with three women, get control of them without any neighbors hearing anything, then take them away, end their lives and dismember the three bodies. This was partly the reason why Lai Xincheng wasn't considered an especially likely suspect at the start of the investigation. Even after the evidence was found in his home and he confessed, it was still surprising to police that he was the one to commit such a brutal crime. Born June 1, 1985, in Daxin, a county around 150 kilometers to the west of Nanning, he grew up in very comfortable material conditions. His parents were successful and wealthy. He was their only child, and while the so-called Little Emperor Syndrome, where rich parents dote on and spoil an only child, usually a boy, is common in China. The parents of Lai Xincheng had a different attitude. They had high expectations of him, and wanted Lai Xincheng to excel and follow in their footsteps to success. They were very strict about his education. Even in primary school he was given little free time to socialize with classmates, or just take time away from the textbooks. However, his parents' efforts weren't having the effect they desired. While not by any means a poor student, he wasn't excelling as they demanded. They followed the route many parents do in China, and began to send him to extra classes outside school hours. In China until recent years, the desire many parents have for their children to get a good score in the high school entrance, or the notorious college entrance exam led them to pay thousands for extracurricular classes. This extra work saw students studying seven days a week, often for 15 or 16 hours a day. 
It may benefit some students, but many more find the workload far too much, and the lack of rest has a negative effect on them, and some will just turn against education and resent it. Lai Xincheng tried to please his parents, but no matter what they did his scores remained the same, not low, but not excellent as his parents demanded. His desire to please, or fear of displeasing his father, once caused him to try ignore appendicitis. His appendix burst and it was only when he passed out from the pain in class did anyone realize something was wrong, and his teacher called an ambulance to transport him to hospital. The incident did nothing to change his parents' attitude. In fact, they would only get stricter when his father discovered his son's diary hidden in his bedroom. In it, Lai Xincheng talked about a romantic relationship he was having with one of his female classmates. Seeing this as a distraction from his studies, his father believed this was the reason he wasn't living up to their expectations. He demanded the relationship end, and to make sure his son was putting everything into his education, he set up surveillance cameras in his bedroom, something that even today is far too common in the country. He would monitor Lai Xincheng as he did homework assignments, and watch how he would spend what little rest time he was allowed to have. At the end of high school, Lai Xincheng would do well enough to gain admission into Nanning Vocational Technical College, choosing to study interior design. However, his parents' reaction was more one of embarrassment than pride. They believed, if they told people in their social circles that their son was attending a relatively unknown vocational school, and not a more respected or prestigious university, they'd lose face. After graduating college, Lai Xincheng actually wanted to return home and stay with his parents, while he tried to start his own business. Having little faith in their son, they told him it would be better for him to stay in Nanying and look for work there. His parents rented him the seventh floor apartment, and Lai Xincheng found work as a designer at a furniture company. He was earning a decent salary, nothing special, but pretty good for a recent college graduate. This would only continue to disappoint his parents, who felt he should be making more. While working he found a girlfriend, the first he'd really had since his middle school sweetheart. She wasn't a college grad herself, but that wasn't something that troubled Lai Xincheng. It would however trouble his parents, who felt the woman was beneath him, and wasn't a good potential wife. Just like during his middle school days, they demanded he break the relationship off. Lai Xincheng, despite now being an adult, still felt he had no choice but to acquiesce to his parents' demands. Heartbroken, and believing that nothing he did was good enough for his parents, he shut himself away in his apartment, and began indulging heavily in online adult material as a way to fulfill the desires that the majority of young men feel. Then he saw the three new tenants who moved into the apartment block, and especially the two women renting the room across from his. He was quickly taken by the youngest of the sisters, Qin Shan. When the two met in the corridor he would try to initiate a conversation, but it wouldn't go much further than polite pleasantries. The 21-year-old Qin Shan showing no interest in Lai Xincheng. Over time he'd begin to develop obsessive behavior towards the young woman, listening for her coming home, and trying to bump into her in the corridor. When not at work, he'd sit in his apartment, listening for her, then watch through the peephole in his door when he heard her coming or going. Lai Xincheng had gone home to his parents during the spring festival that year, but it wasn't a happy occasion for him. His parents pushed him to get married, and told him they'd find him a match themselves if he was unable to find a wife that met their expectations. He still kept a diary, something that he'd been doing since his days in middle school, a place where he'd write the things he couldn't say to his parents. In the diary he wrote about wishing his parents would put less pressure on him, particularly when it came to his romantic relationships. He wrote about not being able to live up to their expectations, and how he now felt like he needed to do something bad, just to release the pressure he felt. If it was this visit to his family that pushed Lai Xincheng to act as he did will never be known for certain, but he decided he had to have Qin Shan. Now he was finally in her apartment with her, along with her two sisters bound, gagged, terrified, and two of them bleeding from the knife wounds he'd inflicted. Over the next few hours, the sisters would each bear witness to the others being violated numerous times by Lai Xincheng. The tape over their mouths muffling any screams or cries for help. Once satisfied, he decided he needed to end the lives of his victims. Each of the sisters received a different death, Lai Xincheng choosing to make the most of the instruments he'd prepared for the assault. Although the information about which sister came to which gruesome end was never made public, the various methods of death would eventually come out. One was bludgeoned with the hammer, one had her throat slashed with the knife, 
and one was choked with the rope. He then put his plan to get rid of the bodies into action. He thought better of doing it in the sister's room in case anyone came knocking for them. He knew he'd have more time and privacy in his own apartment, so needed to move the three bodies. To do this he'd have to drag the bodies one at a time, past another apartment on the corridor. To avoid being seen, he placed some of the duct tape over the peephole of that apartment, placed the bodies into a sack, and dragged each of them to his apartment separately. Once the sisters were in his room, he went back to theirs and cleaned up all evidence of the crime. Doing such a good job when police examined it they only found trace amounts of blood, which could have simply been from a time when one of the residents accidentally cut themselves. Back in his own apartment, he got on with the grisly task of dismemberment in his bathroom. Once the sisters had been broken down enough to be stuffed in the eight bags, he moved them in the dead of night. He needed to make several trips on his electric bike to dump the remains behind the residential community across the city. Returning home, he tried to clean up any trace of the victims, using his sick leave from work to give him enough time. Fortunately for police, he wasn't as conscientious as he'd been in the sister's apartment, and left plenty of evidence of his victim's presence behind. He'd already made the decision not to run and hide, knowing that it would make him the obvious suspect. Instead, he stayed in his apartment, confidently answering all police questions when they came knocking at his door. He would even get a little confrontational with them when they returned to go over his story. When he was asked if he could prove he was sick at the time of the women's disappearance, he snapped back, asking how anyone could possibly prove they had a cold. When police asked for a motive, he put all the blame on his parents, saying that the years of pressure they'd placed on him finally caused him to crack. He would also say that he never intended to end the sisters' lives, he just felt an overwhelming desire to violate them. His interrogators found this somewhat difficult to believe. From what he'd said in his confession, he seemed to have a fairly well thought out plan. The various tools he'd purchased, taking sick leave, thinking about blocking the neighbor's peephole, the bags being prepared, having a difficult to disprove alibi, and the location the bodies were found appearing to have been picked out well in advance, all pointed to this being three very intentional homicides. The police believed there was a different motive for what he decided to do. The three sisters were living a life he felt he was never going to be allowed to have. They were running their own business as he had dreams of doing, and seemed to be free of any pressure or demands from their parents. While he was constantly failing to live up to his parents' expectations, they were happily living their own lives, and this angered him. Combining this with his attraction towards Qin Shen going no further than a few polite greetings when the two saw each other on the corridor of the seventh floor, he decided to act and punish the sisters for living a life he couldn't. The theory was just speculation from the officers who interrogated him, as they found it difficult to believe someone with no criminal record would end the lives of the three sisters and go through the process of dismembering their bodies just because he felt attracted to one of them. On July 3, 2009, Lai Xincheng faced trial. The father of his three victims, overcome by emotion at the sight of the man who'd ended the lives of three of his daughters, had to be held back by police after attempting to attack Lai Xincheng. Lai Xincheng was found guilty of violating the three women, intentional homicide and desecration of their corpses. Showing some support for their son, perhaps for the first time in his life, his parents lodged an appeal. They tried to argue that since their son had confessed, albeit after being questioned many times, and eventually taken responsibility for the crimes, that he should be given a lighter punishment. His defense lawyers offered no new evidence or any kind of extenuating circumstances to support his case. The appeal would be rejected, and the death sentence stood. Standing in court to hear the verdict, Dai Xincheng looked towards his parents. Finally, he wouldn't see the look of disappointment he was well used to, Instead, the expression on their faces was only one of sadness as he was led away. Lai Xincheng was executed by lethal injection on the 22nd of July 2010. In a letter he wrote just prior to his death, Lai Xincheng apologized to his parents for not being what they wanted him to be. He went on to tell them not to be upset about his death as he deserved to die. However, in the 13,000-word letter, there was little in way of an apology to the father and older sister of Qin Shan, Qin Qiaoping, and Qin Jiemei. Any remorse he showed seemed to be because he got caught and disappointed his parents once more, rather than the crimes he committed. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. And hope to see you again for the next dark tale from the Middle Kingdom.